guests have arrived to witness the opening of a new park. Another link in the emerald necklace has been forged. Another small connection with nature has been added to the chain. It's called the Madrid Park. Not long ago, it was a spot of unused land next to a school and by a billboard. Now, it's part of the emerald necklace. Hello, and welcome back to the Wild Gardens. I'm your host, Martin Hale. On our last visit to the Emerald Necklace, we looked at a brief history of this region in Southern California. We looked at archival photographs of the land that became Emerald Necklace Parks, and we met Claire Robinson, founder of the Amigos de Las Rios group that carried out the Emerald Necklace vision. Today's the day to see the Emerald Necklace Parks as they are at present. To begin, rivers run through the Emerald Necklace. Looking at the map, that dark green line on the right is the San Gabriel River. The dark green line on the left is the Los Angeles River. The smaller green line connecting the two larger lines is the Rio Hondo River. Current Emerald Necklace sites are located near the San Gabriel or Rio Hondo rivers, west of the 605 freeway. Let's have a closer look at the San Gabriel River as it is today. The story starts here, high in the San Gabriel Mountains, where springs and streams like this one flow into one of the forks of the San Gabriel River. The upper forks of the San Gabriel River have some beautiful riparian areas that are as pretty as any you'll see in the wild gardens of California. After running free and easy, the waters are captured in a series of reservoirs. Not long after that, it's encased in a concrete prison to keep it under control. There is a beautiful section down the river that has been left more or less untouched. It's called the Whittier Narrows. Behind me is the San Gabriel River. This is what the river must have once looked like. It's the only place left in this entire stretch that has the look of the old days. When I was a kid, I used to play in this river before it was cemented in. What a place it was, and what good times we had. After the Narrows, it's the concrete prison all the way to the sea. So, after tumbling out of the San Gabriel Mountains, going through two reservoirs, flowing across eastern L.A. County, it finally reaches its end here at the Pacific Ocean. It finally escapes its concrete cage. The San Gabriel River ends here. The first park, geographically, is the northernmost site located in the Azusa Canyon, which is in the San Gabriel Mountains. Years ago, if I remember correctly, this site had a trailer on it. As you came up the canyon, you pulled over, and the rangers would take your fees, pass out maps, and give information. There wasn't much else here but look at what it looks like now. The Amigos de las Rios group built a wonderful park here, as well as this building housing the interpretive center and restrooms. 
When I came here in mid-spring, they had native plants growing everywhere. This is a great place to visit for its own sake. I can't recommend it enough. The walkways and benches have this way of drawing you in from one section to the next. And if you're sitting, perfect views of the park, mostly in the shade, I might add. As you'll see with many of the parks, the fencing is unique in design and sometimes themed. While we're up here, let's drive up the road and meet with Claire Robinson, the founder of Amigos de los Rios, the nonprofit organization that develops, designs, and builds the Emerald Necklace Parks. Well, we're going to talk to Claire again now that we've begun to look at some of the parks as finished projects. I'd like to get Claire's uh, take on what comes next and what things flow from these finished parks. Well, the great thing about putting one of these restoration parks into the world is that then we have to own it over time. I don't mean literally own it, I mean care for it. So now we're seeing groups of people ranging from families with young children, veterans, seniors of different persuasions, uh, groups of teenagers, groups from local colleges, groups from local high schools, starting to convene at our Saturday events, which we have like clockwork somewhere along the Emerald Necklace, and do the work of ongoing care. So you operate with volunteers? Yes, we bring lots of wonderful people together, and everyone has something to contribute, whether it's planting a native tree, a shrub, grooming, old school weeding, taking care of replacing interpretive signs, painting. And I think what's really fun is the mix of people that are starting to come out and the literacy, the level of literacy that they have about each other, about the bigger watershed, about nature in the city. It's fun to watch and you never know what's gonna happen next, but it's all good. So I, I've watched uh, uh, one of the plantings and we've of course seen that on, on the show. Um, and you have a, a wide variety of people working at these. Now, what happens in the future, Claire? I mean, mm -hmm. that's them, they're planting something or they're doing this. What happens 10 years from now? Well, now we have a few thousand people on our email list. We need a couple million. There are 14 million people in LA County, more or less. We need to activate everyone and make sure that Saturday, Sunday, great form of exercise, great way to meet new people and transform, be part of a legacy. This needs to be the new normal. Citizen science, exercise outdoors, overcoming that nine minutes a day, current average that American children spend outdoors. This is, this. this is a green minor revolution. Would it's you a, repeat that once more for the audience? Yes. Because I've never heard this before. Well, currently, statistics show American children spend nine minutes a day on average outdoors. And I think that has a huge impact on developmental issues. It, it is effectively changing the way our synapses fire, the way we think, Wait. the way we deal with issues and problems and complexity. So spending more time outdoors is an absolute necessity to keep our DNA <laughs> moving in the, in the right direction. <laughs> That nature, you got to have it, don't you? Got to have nature. I can't do without it. Got to have nature. So, all right, you have a mailing list. You plan on expanding it. Basically, you see all of these parts that you're establishing as maintained mm -hmm. by volunteers well, into the future. Let's face it, we're looking at critical times where you know the economy is uh, definitely challenged. We've got a lot of people power, underemployed people, people who are unemployed children, youth who want to learn, and it's an internship. You know, it's, it's getting into the complexity of sustainable city design, being uh, able to keep moving. The momentum that people have when they come together in, in leveraging the grant funding that's available, which is scarce, really makes the difference. So we might have funding to buy some trees, but we put the trees in with community. So it's the stone soup model where we really, really think efficiently and put all of our brain power together. And we're gonna make an emerald necklace network that connects the Angeles Forest, San Gabriel Mountains to the ocean 
and it's going to transform the way people think of Los Angeles worldwide. I love it. Thank you very much, Claire. Thanks for hanging out with us. All right. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> Saturday. I'll be there. Okay. <laughs> Part of the success of the Emerald Necklace Parks is due to the volunteers who give their time and labor. All of the parks have had generous help from these volunteers in a number of tasks, including planting. I watched a busload of volunteers of all ages come to a new site, disembark, and get to it. The organization and effort was very impressive. Under the auspices of Amigos de los Rios, even young children get an opportunity to plant. It was a lot of fun to watch them work. Kids play in playgrounds where native plants are planted and thrive. I begin to see the beneficial effect that the Rios group has been aiming for, re-establishing that connection with nature. And speaking of connection with nature, let's see how the Peck Road Park turned out. Remember what it looked like before? Now it looks like this. The holding basin we saw on our last visit has become a small lake due to the bottom silting up. This is a great park. It's big, with great features. As well as the small lakes, Amigos planted rare Engelman oaks along with other botanical offerings. Many species of birds visit this site. They actually have bird counts here. The water, the trees, the entire park is an attractant to birds and this fact contributes to the connection with nature that Amigos de los Rios is designing into its parks. In our last visit, one of the other parks that was in its formative stages was the Rio Vista Park. Now, this site already existed, but it was run down and in complete need of restoration. Amigos restored it along the lines of their other creations with astonishing results. The native plants here are beautifully presented and the whole place has been completely revitalized from scratch. If the Rio Hondo weren't encased in cement, this park would be a real return to the past in several ways. The Tongva tribe is celebrated here. If you were with us on our last visit, you may remember the Tongva dwelling called Kish. Now look at this. Does it look familiar? Here's an engraving of some Tongva phrases. And a rendition of a Tongva fire ring. The Rio Vista Park celebrates another way of life here as well. It's built in a place that was once known as Hicks Camp. People who lived here when the area was still agricultural worked as farm laborers and field hands for the local farmers. Hicks Camp was a barrio, and a whole way of life developed here along the banks of the Rio Hondo River. This is another wonderful Emerald Necklace Park. For me, it's got this trail through the native plants and the recognition of the very local history. For the kids, it's a great place to play. And the pictures of the children playing in the water long ago at Hicks Camp, that was my friends and I. Different time, but that was us too. Visit Rio Vista any time of the year, but if you want to see the wild gardens, come in the spring. You'll be surprised at the whole park, I promise. Now I know that the San Gabriel Mountains represent a complete link with nature for many local residents. Any wilderness area can give you a connection to nature that no place in the city can. Amigos de los Rios is attempting to bring a flavor of nature back to these dense urban areas. I got a chance to speak with Mark Masaoka of the Asian Pacific Policy and Planning Council, whose interest is working with San Gabriel Mountains agencies. This is Mark Masaoka. And Mark, yes. uh, tell me a little bit about your organization. I'm with the Asian Pacific Policy and Planning Council, 
and we're an association of, of Asian Pacific community organizations in Los Angeles and in the San Gabriel Valley. And we got involved with the San Gabriel Mountains Forever campaign because we noticed that our children were growing up and they didn't have the experiences of being able to walk along streams, of being able to see the vast fields of wildflowers. And even though we, 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 you're driving by them all the time on the 210 freeway. And so we thought it was important that they be exposed to that and found that the resources to be able to get into the, the, the different recreational areas is, is quite limited. The parking is hard. It's hard to find maps about exactly where to go. And it just was difficult to access. And we thought it was important that we be able to be able to take our families and, and community groups up to these areas and see it for themselves. So have you rectified some of this? Have you uh, increased parking, gotten maps? Well, that's what the goal is. We believe that if we become part of the national park system, then that will increase the kinds of, of, of support and funding that can support those kinds of uh, access to these, these wonderful wild areas that we have. Now, how do you think that all ties in with the emerald necklace? Well, the emerald necklace is a way of, of taking some of the local areas downstream and showing people what kind of flowers are around, be able to see that there really are things. And if you want to see the real, the big stuff, then that's when you go up to the mountains. I see. And as far as water sustainability? Well, some of the concerns that, that, that our, our member organizations have had has been that a lot of them have immigrants who have come here from Asia where water cleanliness and, and, and air quality has been very, very serious issues. And so those concerns they bring with them when they're here. And air quality and, and water quality are high among them. And so that was another reason why we thought San, Gab San Gabriel Mountains was important for us to be involved with. As a watershed. As a watershed. And uh, especially because there were issues about some of the old industrial plants that had been here and some of the, the impact that they had had on, on the, the water, water quality uh, of this area. And we wanted to make sure that those, those kinds of issues were addressed. So basically, as I'm understanding it, it kind of flows from here down into the, the rest of the Emerald Necklace as they are setting up the parks. That's where I first learned about the Emerald Necklace, was in the El Monte area. Uh -huh. Well, thank you very much. It's thank a you. pleasure meeting you, sir. Thank you. It's true about connecting the big stuff upstream to the little stuff downstream, as Mark just put it. A case in point is the Lashbrook Park. In our last visit, we saw it as an unused strip of land between the Rio Honda River and houses. This is it today. What a difference. I really like this park. On its rather straight trail, you walk past native plant after native plant. There's not much of this park, but what there is has been masterfully designed and laid out. As a wild gardener, Lashbrook really works for me. We come finally to the Gibson Mariposa Park. Last visit, we found out that the local school children were asked what kind of park they wanted here, and they voted for a park that butterflies would come to. That's what it looked like then, and I ask, is this the kind of place you would build a park that butterflies would come to? Well, Amigos de los Rios thought so, and they were right. This is some park. First of all, they pulled out all the stops on the butterfly theme. Just look at this playground. And like their other emerald necklace sites, they planted native plants everywhere.
Did the butterflies come? There's the answer. There were lots of them flying around, but this one was the most cooperative. There can't be that many parks in the world cities that bring all of these thematic elements together and have butterflies as well. The Gibson Mariposa Park is another masterpiece of planning, design, execution, and ultimately, amazingly, delivering butterflies that really seem to like the place. Mariposa means butterfly in Spanish. Going back to the emerald necklace map, we follow the two dark lines down. The Los Angeles River is on the left. The San Gabriel River is on the right. We eventually come to the Pacific Ocean. Continuing down, we see Catalina Island. It's like a beautiful pendant hanging from the emerald necklace chain. Now the Catalina Island Conservancy is not part of Amigos de los Rios. However, they are engaged in some similar activities. Since the management at both organizations thought it would be a good idea to include Catalina native plants, we got invited for a visit. The visit was brief, but wonderful. I've spent many happy times here since adolescence. In those days, I was either in the water, fishing, or diving, or in Avalon somewhere. This time, we're going to the interior, and that for me is where the magic happens. We were driven by Bob Ryan of the Catalina Island Conservancy and were met by Peter Dixon, who is the Conservancy botanist. This has been a very dry year and it's late spring. In spite of all that, Peter had some natives still in flower to show. Some of these plants look closely related to counterparts on the mainland, some of them not so but all, with the exception of one or two, seem alien, as though I were visiting a foreign country. As we drove around the interior, I would see places that looked like they could be on the mainland, yet the trees, shrubs, and plants always looked slightly off, reminding me that we were not on the mainland. It all seemed very exotic to us. It's been one of those rare privileges to come to Catalina and visit the interior of the island in detail. There are many, many more flowering native plants and shrubs growing on Catalina Island. I would love to come back and film a couple of shows after a good rainy winter. Anything could happen. It's been one of those rare privileges to visit and experience even a small sampling of Catalina native plants. The thing that Claire has stressed most when answering my questions about the Emerald Necklace Parks is the amount of teamwork that has gone into every aspect of their formation and ultimate completion. The volunteers who come out every week to maintain the parks. The volunteers who come out to help plant the parks. Without the help of these good people, the parks would begin to degrade. From my own observations, these folks see the value of the Emerald Necklace Parks to their community and are glad to give freely of their time. Others have helped as well, and the help has been vital. Three people come to mind that Claire's talked about. 
One of these persons is County Supervisor Gloria Molina. Supervisor Molina has made the red tape regulations road that the Amigos group must travel on much smoother. According to Claire, Supervisor Molina has been willing to lend her assistance to the Amigos group because she sees the value of the park system to her constituents. Another person from the county whose help has been invaluable is Mark Pastrella, Assistant Director of the Los Angeles County Department of Public Works. He has worked out an accord of understanding and cooperation that has helped the parks become a reality. The third person is Richard Atwater. Now, Mr. Atwater is the Executive Director of the Southern California Water Committee. Mr. Atwater commented, The Emerald Necklace is a celebration of Southern California and is respectful of our water resources and protects water quality. These people and many others have been instrumental in making the Emerald Necklace Parks a reality. It's all a package. The help received from outside parties, the skills that Claire and the team at Amigos bring, and the wonderful work of the volunteers. The quality of the entire infrastructure of the parks is exacting, of a purpose, and beautiful to look at. For example, Amigos engaged an artisan to do the themed ironwork on the fences, benches, and gates. Every spring, I like to drive up the Azusa Canyon to walk in some of my favorite spots. I will never be able to do that again without stopping at the Gateway Park. If I'm near the Peck Road Park, I'll stop to see how things are growing and evolving. The same is true of the Gibson Mariposa Park, where butterflies really do come. And the Rio Vista and Lashbrook Parks? I'll be back. Each park has its own flavor. I'll never forget my visits to the Emerald Necklace. I'm your host, Martin Hale. Until then, so long.